You know, I can't believe it sometimes. Didn't come easy. Took a lot of hard work. It certainly did. The idea of each family in a community producing something different, dividing up the labour, mechanising, that's what made the difference. Mm. We make really wonderful clothes now. Oh, yeah. We've got a right to be proud. And the farmers produce terrific wheat and barley. Mm. The cowards are turning out the best beef and cream I've ever tasted. Pity about the shepherds. I'm getting a bit fed up with the shepherds. Though you've got to admit their mutton is better than anything we could produce, dear. When we manage to get any of it. Anyway, don't forget the fishers. That trout of theirs yesterday. Oh, oh. And our idea of putting everything we all produce into common stores so that every family can take what it needs works really well. Well, up to a point, anyway. We'd have had salmon yesterday if the shepherds hadn't got to the barn first. Mm. We had to have the fishers' trout instead. Still, it was better than anything we could have caught. Mm. Better food isn't the only advantage, you know. That's true enough. There's more food for everybody now. After all, when you spend all your time at your one job, you become more skilled at it. Our looms are the most efficient this valley has ever seen. We get ten times the amount of cloth from this beauty, and it doesn't take any more effort either. You've got to admire the fishers, though. Yes, that boat they made to get down the stream to fish in the lake. Brilliant idea. And they spent all those evenings making a huge trawling net. Beautifully designed floats and everything. They must have increased their catch 20 times over with that net. The masons increased their productivity in just the same way. So have the farmers and the shepherds. I know all about the shepherds, thank you very much. You do go on about the shepherds, dear. Yeah, and with reason. There they are, look at it again. Not, not again. This week, all they've put in the barn is one mangy lamb. <sighs> And what are they taking out of the common food, you may ask? It does look a bit suspect. Would you believe it? And they've got three times as many sheep as the cowards have got cattle. Oh. Mrs Coward knows what they're up to. They're cheating and salting away all her beef for a rainy day. Mind you, Mrs Coward doesn't have much right to complain. She walked off with all the best raspberries last week. We've got to face facts, you know. This idea of a common pool hasn't worked out as well as you thought it would. Yes, and we're not the only ones who think so. <clears throat> this business of sharing doesn't work. Um, it's not fair. By the time our family gets to the barn, the best stuff is gone. The share-out is far from equal. And it's not only that. Look what's happening now. Just because there's a glut of vegetables that nobody wants, we have to throw away all those turnips. After all that work, too. And don't forget that terrible row over the raspberries. Um, disgraceful behaviour. After that, Mr Mason thought we should put him in charge of everything. Oh, that man makes me so mad. Ooh, look at him showing off. He said because he was the strongest person in the valley, he'd guarantee to make sure that everybody would put everything into the barn. He said he would personally divide it all up and issue everybody with their own share. Yeah, I'll bet he would. Anyway, we all knew what that would mean, having your head knocked in by Mr Mason. Well, you had a bright idea. No, I had an inspiration. I suddenly had the notion of nobody putting any produce into the barn at all and everybody keeping everything they made for themselves. <laughs> Mrs Fisher immediately said that would mean they'd eat nothing but fish for the rest of their lives. <laughs> and Mr Carpenter asked you if you expected him to eat hammers and nails for his supper. <laughs> yes, he oh. did, as a matter of fact. And Mrs Farmer said, where was she supposed to get new clothes when the old ones wore out? Well, it did seem a reasonable question in the circumstances. But it was. I, I, I mean, it is. Don't you see? We can't possibly wear all the clothes we make, but we do need corn and milk, and we do need fruit and fish, and we do need all the other things everybody else makes and grows. So? So, we'd swap. <gasps> An inspiration! That's what they all said. Mr Fisher immediately noticed that if the shepherds didn't produce enough sheep, 
they wouldn't have anything to exchange. And Mrs Carpenter said, right, no mutton from the shepherds and they don't get the fences from me for their lambing pens. And if the shepherds didn't like the new plan, they could lump it and leave. It would just mean more grazing for the cattle. We'd have just as much meat as before, but it would be beef instead of mutton. It's a way of making the shepherds behave, without having to put Mr Mason in charge of everything. Mm -hmm. Everybody was delighted. Although he's not that bright sometimes, even Mr Mason began to see how he would benefit. That's how we all agreed to have a swapping day, every week in the square in front of the big barn. Remember that first day? The fishers brought an enormous load of beautiful fresh salmon. Beautiful it was. Everybody swapped their cloth, their milk, their fruit, and even a stool from Mr Carpenter for the fish. Swapping worked so well, we began to do it every day. For things like raspberries and, and milk and fish that don't last, but we want every day. There was no end of what we could swap if somebody else wanted it. Even Mr Mason promised to build a jetty for the fishers if they would supply him with one salmon a week for the whole year. Yes, everybody thought it was a wonderful system, except the shepherds. They brought practically nothing to swap. When anyone made a bargain, it would be marked on the wall for everyone to see. That's why we called our square the Market Place. It became the busiest place in the village. In fact, it became the village centre. Oh dear, the shepherds had a pretty thin time that first day, especially as the fishers had brought along masses of salmon, which made up for the shortage of mutton. That night, the shepherds went home practically empty-handed. But the next week was a different story. The shepherds came back with an enormous supply of sheep. Mrs Shepherd said that last week, oh, she'd lost her sheep and didn't know where to find them till this week. And if you believe that, you'll believe anything. Well, as time went by, the market became the best family outing of the week. Not only did everyone discover the value of their produce for everyone else that day, they saw all their work rewarded. They discovered other things too. They found out what was happening in the village. They found out what people needed so that they knew what to provide next time. Of course, the word market didn't really originate from the mark on the wall of the barn. And the world we're living in these days is very different to the kind of life you saw in our village. But from time to time, people do try to live without markets. The famous example is the kibbutz in Israel. Here, everyone works for the community. But the most successful depend on growing or producing things which are then exported and sold in the markets of the world to provide money for the kibbutz's common pool. In return for their work, people get food and shelter. But few of the kibbutz are really self-sufficient. In the 1960s, many groups of hippies tried to make new lives for themselves by getting together to grow their own food, make their own clothes, and even build their own villages. Their idea was to share everything equally, but not many of their communities flourished. Some people found life too hard. There were personality clashes and people walked out. Others needed doctors or medicines, and when there weren't any, they left too. But hippie communes that survived tended to specialize in crafts, leather work, gem work, and jewelry. But to sell their work and to buy what they needed to live, they had to take their wares outside to the market. Like the people in a kibbutz, they quickly realised the undeniable advantages of a market to the survival of their chosen way of life. Markets just spring up spontaneously. Look at car boot sales. Nobody launched them, they just happened. Now tens of thousands of people go there every week. And when the internet arrived, it became a worldwide market in cyberspace. There are markets for everything. Big things, small things, even markets in ideas like leisure and holidays. Perhaps the commonest everywhere in the world are the markets for the food we eat. They are important meeting places too. People may go to buy and sell, but they don't miss the chance to catch up on the local news and discuss local issues. 
But along with all the swapping, there is an information system at work. Information about what there is to sell and what there is to buy. Information about what is scarce and what is plentiful. Information about what's not worth much and what is considered valuable. Markets that flourish do so because they work. If they didn't, they'd soon go out of business because voluntary transactions that don't work tend not to be repeated. People are like that, regardless of the control and politics of the societies in which they live. They come away from the market immediately satisfied with what they've acquired and what they've learnt. And that's the nature of every market in the world.